Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Sometimes it's hard to tell when one election ends and the next one begins. The chaos of campaigning never seems to stop. Are we paying too much attention to this perpetual horse race and not enough to the issues of real concern to the voters? I'll ask my guest, one of America's most experienced public opinion experts, Dr. Lee Mirangoff, director of the Marist Institute for Public Opinion at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Lee, great to see you. Pleasure, Bob. So, um, big election and a big route for the Republicans. Were you surprised or were you all over that? Well, we, we saw it emerging. I mean, I think it looked like there was, you know, most of the polls were showing there were these 10 states that for the Senate were going to be very competitive. And then they all started moving a little bit the Republican direction. And our last week of polls showed, you know, some of these states that had been competitive, like Kentucky and Georgia, and the Republicans are now starting to open up. So uh, the magnitude of the win obviously caught people somewhat surprised because, you know, each of them moved. You know, right. you, you tend to view these things as individual races, but then they seem to go like dominoes. And when they start to fall, um, they all sort of went. So I, I don't think it was a shock. Uh, uh, you know, President Obama, obviously unpopular, right. uh, and that perhaps more than anything was a unifying force. Um, you know, Republicans ran against them right. and Democrats went, ran away from them. <laughs> so there wasn't much left uh, for any kind of message on the part of the Democrats, which we can obviously yeah. talk about. The, um, I'm always curious as to uh, how you spend election night. You, got, you guys work like crazy all the way up to the election, but I have like this image of you on the couch with a <laughs> beer and a bag of chips. I, uh, I'm never sure happened. that's wrong, right? Never happened. <laughs> how do you spend election uh, night? Typically we're with some organization, some media organization. Uh, this this year we were sort of hopping around to different places. Spent a lot of the night uh, on uh, WCBS radio. Uh, radio is fun uh, because you know you got to you can have your notes. <laughs> you don't have to worry actually, about what you look like. I actually love radio. I don't know if you should say that on a television <laughs> yeah, program, well, but well, here you have to be careful uh, <laughs> right. with the gestures there, and they're, and they're great, and we, and we have a good time, and we've done stuff. Um, we've had some great times uh, at WNBC. Uh, I recall uh, in uh, 2008 when uh, Barack Obama was first elected, right. we were down at the rink in Rockefeller Center and had our little area, and I was with David Ushery, who's a great anchor there, and, and uh, actually did not realize that our uh, voices were the ones that were being projected to the entire crowd of tens of thousands <laughs> of people. Uh, so at one point I said, this crowd is you know, fired up and ready to go, and then there was this huge cheer emerged <laughs> from the crowd, and I had this one sense, you don't get that in class at Marist, I mean, I never right. get a standing ovation or anything, but here you got that sense of people being connected yeah. to the process um, and reacting. 2008, obviously a very different time in our politics than, than, than not. So the answer is, our polling is typically done, but we're usually connected to the exit polls, which right. are done on election day itself. Um, and we're sort of interpreting those uh, and then looking with a scorecard to see how we did with all our predictions and the things like that. So you mentioned uh, 2008, it was an historic night yeah, and people were excited from uh, coast to coast. There was this tremendous yeah. uh, promise, but it, it, it was a very uh, obviously tough economic time. Yeah. Uh, Obama was dealt uh, a terrible hand to yeah. begin um, his presidency. Mm -hmm. But now the latest election results show um, sort of the opposite extreme. Things seem to have gone so, um, you know, quite sour. So, you know, what's the reality? Was it, you know, the high was maybe too high, but, but perhaps this low is somewhat too low. What do you yeah. think? Well, I, I think you're correctly identifying. We seem to lurch one way and then another and, 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 and with great, uh, distance being covered in our political spectrum. So we go from 2008 and Barack Obama to the Tea Party in 2010. <laughs> right, I mean, right. so you've covered a lot of ground in a very short time politically. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It has to do with the media and has to do, you know, with so, so some degree with, you know, how people are only now responding to views that they are, you know, pretty much reinforcing what they right. think themselves. So we've got that real polarization that's been there for a long time, certainly since, since the Clintons. Um, so you really have that kind of um, back and forth in our politics. And, and, and you know, I, I think on the one hand, it speaks to the resiliency of the American people still searching for results. Maybe we can find it with that group because the previous group hasn't provided what we want. I think it talks a lot about our campaigns and how there's such a huge disconnect 
between candidates running for office and candidates, uh, elected officials governing right. once they take the oath of office. And we're seeing that you know, gap just widening and widening uh, to the, you know, not to the betterment of the democracy. I mean, I think we have some real fundamental issues that are, are sort of glossed over in these 30 second TV ads that we're getting bombarded by. So, so I think we've had a, you know, it's, it's been an interesting time. I think people want results. I think they have serious concerns. Um, I think the campaigns have gone down to these kind of like bumper sticker slogans uh, and, and we're just not getting that kind of dialogue that's really going to create some kind of sustained change. Right. So we get this um, almost perpetual campaign, yes, absolutely. but you don't have a serious discussion of the issues. You get sound bites, you get yeah. campaign ads, you get the attack, attack ads and, and, and that sort of thing. And I agree with you about the idea that um, you hear one thing from candidates during the campaign, but they behave a different way once yeah. they become uh, elected officials. Yeah. And that seems to be what the electorate is so upset about. Yeah. But one of the thing, things that seems striking is, you and I have been at this for a while <laughs> now, the electorate has gone back and forth yeah. so many times yeah. from the days of Jimmy Carter and, and, yeah. and Ronald Reagan to uh, Bill Clinton and, and, and the first uh, George Bush, sure. uh, you know, and then Barack Obama yeah. and now Republican wave. So th there's always dissatisfaction and yeah. they're always seeking change. Is it a case of the elected officials just don't get it or is it the case that the voters want too much? You, yeah. you well, no, I, well, I think the voters are, are probably in touch with what they want. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, a, there's an issue here. It's called, you know, standard of living. I right. mean, people are having difficulty <laughs> making agree. ends meet. Um, so, you know, we've heard it's the economy stupid and that goes way back now. Uh, and that know, goes all the way back decades, to 92, right? Decades. We're, yeah. talking, we're talking a generation ago yeah. uh, for, for all intents and purposes. And yet this election, what was the number one issue on people's minds? Jobs and, and the economy. So it, what was the being debated? No, I mean, it's not there. The macro numbers are getting better. But people are not experiencing it, and they're very concerned about the direction of the country. And, and that creates this lurching, too, because they're not getting results. The system is, in a sense, broken and dysfunctional for a lot of people. So you anticipated one of my um, okay. questions. I could absolutely agree with you that the issue is always jobs and the economy. Yeah. And I've been writing about this for, for yeah. so long. Um, and yet, we have not yeah. seen public officials emerge who, after getting elected, will focus like a laser on the oh, issue yeah. of employment. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it um, because they don't think uh, government can do much about employment? Well, what do you think? Well, I think we're in a period where our institutions are being challenged, not just government, but the media and religion and health care and education. I mean, people are just not in a in an upbeat mood about much of anything right, right. now. So, so, I mean, I think that's a, that's a lot of what's going on, and I don't think, in, in a sense, that there is a, if the campaigns don't have a clear message, that's not going to sustain itself through the governing process. So there is no, I mean, people claim mandates, but there really aren't. I mean, we really haven't had any, right. any campaigns that have, you know, politicians can turn around and say, I was really elected to do this. Even 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected, I mean, they, they claimed that was a, con you know, a conservative endorsement, but the numbers really suggested it was a, a throw the bums out and, election. And, and Reagan wasn't nearly as conservative as, what as a lot of Republicans oh, sure. like to say yes, he, he no, was. So, right. so, so, so you, you didn't even have it then when it was even clearer, perhaps, than it is today. But look, you have this terrible polarization. You've got, you know, divided government, which is going to make it hard for folks to get along. You have both sides of the aisle and now both sides of, of Washington from the White House to Capitol of different parties, different agendas. And you, you alluded to the perpetual campaign. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell's already talked about it. He's got a lot of, <laughs> lot of guys in the Senate with sharp elbows. Yep. And they're thinking about Iowa and they're thinking about New Hampshire. Exactly. And, you know, uh, Chris Christie was, I don't know, well, was he in X number of states during this last campaign in Iowa eight or nine times? The gov Republican governor of Iowa was not having any trouble getting reelected. Uh, and, and as far as I know, the restaurants don't match what he can get in the New York metropolitan area. The, so uh, The campaign for 2016 is already underway. Yes, I yes. mean, it, it's... If you look back to a earlier era about when people actually announced their candidacies, I think people would be shocked. They would be that shocked. You could actually do it in the year 
of the primaries. You I didn't think have to when do Bobby it. Kennedy yes. first ran for when, when he ran for a senator from mm -hmm. New York, from New York, that was in the I think summer. he I think he announced in August. Yes, it was in the summer. <laughs> and when, he, when and he, the election was in November. Yes, and when he announced for president, uh, that was in March, I believe. Yeah. Uh, during the primary. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. So the uh, this so is how I impress, not... this is how I impress my students at Marist. You know? <laughs> it's not that I know a lot, but I lived through that period. So yeah, we, <laughs> we we both have. I agree. So, and speaking of that, yeah. uh, talk a little bit about how surveying public opinion has changed over uh, those decades. I mean, the technology now just yeah. um, knock your socks off. But Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we shed our technological skin every couple of years <laughs> doing this. Uh, you know, I mean, when we started, I mean, it literally was paper and pencil. I mean, right. We had the phone numbers on index cards, and, you know, the students had to, you know, indicate them. They were, in a sense, randomly spinning digits. The theory was the same, but just how we did it was so different. And they had like, you know, what looked like a multiple choice answer test kind of sheet. <laughs> right. And they'd write in the numbers and we would manually input those. And, and it all took, you know, days and days and days. We used to mail our results Is to reporters. Right? Uh, so, you know, we went to the <laughs> copy center. They copied them, we mailed them. I mean, now we get done with the poll, we better have it in the next news cycle such as there is a news cycle, but certainly the next day, um, or the numbers are already considered to be too, uh, too dated. So now it all happens very, very quickly. We use the same theory. We're going to have students uh, interviewing live students, <laughs> interviewing real people on landlines and cells, but we also have this new industry, which you alluded to, the technological changes that um, really are guided by a faster, cheaper, and I would say more questionable quality in terms of their numbers, but that feeds a different appetite. It feeds the horse race. Right. It feeds the, the kind of numbers that sometimes, oftentimes dwarf any discussion of what voters have. So we, we do the issue stuff too. We find out what people care about. Obviously, you know, who's ahead and who's behind is important in a, in a media sense, but maybe not ultimately to the public. Talk about the questionable uh, quality of, of some of these efforts. Is that because it's done too fast, the samples are too small? What's the problem? Well, I, you know, I think they're, they're not reaching necessarily the, the, the proper audience. I mean, doing a good poll is to make a recipe, and you have to have all the right ingredients so you can have this, you know, the right flavor of the electorate, if you will. And, and if you're missing groups, if you're not calling them back, if you, uh, there, there's all kinds of problems that, that can set in. Um, you don't even know who you're talking to on the other end of the line when the robocall. I mean, right. yeah, mommy, this guy's on, like, oh, just punch some numbers uh, right. and you know, move on. You know, so you get a six-year-old now. The six-year-olds have broken four. Which that, that's right. They? That's right. We'll have the, we'll have those numbers for you immediately. Um, so, so I mean, there's there's that problem. Then you have a whole area of people who are in the partisan polling business. So they show up. They will in 2016. Uh, you know, there'll be groups that some of the PACs and interest groups will have doing polls to affect these averages on some of these aggregators that you hear about, the 538s and the real clear politics and all those places now that, you know, compile polls and keep score kind of. Um, and those polls are, you know, of really quite, I mean, there the motive is influencing public opinion and also just trying to move the numbers so that your candidate looks better um, and so that's really very dangerous. Then they have a whole other world, which is uh, the, the, you know, the real industry of campaigns using hired gunslingers right. to shape their message. And, and that's a whole, you know, we sort of get thrown in with all this and, you know, we're in the public opinion side of it. So we're <laughs> out there, uh, you know, not trying to affect public opinion, but just really trying to and not measure working it. for one yeah, and not And not party, having right? any part. I mean, we function much as a traditional journalist. Well. Right. With all the changes that have yeah. occurred, what do you um, like about the new way, new way of polling, the new technology, and what are you not so crazy about? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I like the fact that we're now able to reach cell phone people better than we used to. Uh, and it's really important because cell phone only households right. have become, an, if you're not doing them, you're, you're, you're missing a big group. I was and, shocked at the New York Times when I had a couple of assistants, you know, and you're just saying, and somebody who works for you, what's, you know, what's your phone number? And they give you a cell phone number. Yeah. And you go, well, well, you know, what's your home yeah. number? And, and they go, this is the only number I have. But there was a time when people were not, you know, some of the, look, it costs more to reach someone on a cell phone than it does on a landline. Be for a lot of reasons, none of which, you know, we don't have to get into all the technology of it, but 
you know, we can't auto dial them uh, because it was a time when they were being charged minutes, so you couldn't, in right. a sense, look like you were telemarketing, even though you really weren't. Uh, right. And so that that became a problem with the cell phones. And you know, people sort of thought when the cell phone was their private phone, their landline was their community phone. So if you called somebody on their cell phone. It was sort of like, how'd you get into oh, the... that was now, a no-no. Yeah, now the cell phone is sort of your mode of communication. Yeah. So we're finding that uh, that's become easier for us to reach people, and it is the wave of the future as far as the scientific rigorous polling is concerned. Um, the wave of the future for others is going to be these other methods of doing polls off of you know, panels, of opt-in panels. We're seeing a lot of that. It's, um, it sounds new, modern, crisp, and up-to-date. Uh, I'm not sure whether the accuracy will be borne out over time with those with those approaches. What are you finding with um, uh, younger voters now? Are, are, are there differences in the way their uh, parents voted or in the way yeah. they respond to surveys or the yeah, things that they're interested in? Yeah, you know, you know, we go through cycles, and I see this sometimes with my students, and then I see it in our poll numbers also, in the individual state polls and, and in our national polls. You know, we went through sort of a Reagan young student right, time, I um, and then we went through uh, an Obama time, and now I'm just starting to think, you know, whether there's a kind of a libertarian sentiment out there among young people. I'm wondering if uh, Senator Paul may, you know, tap into some of that uh, when he runs, uh, presumably, in the uh, next presidential election and appeal to some younger people who people assume are, you know, you know, owned by the Democrats, and I'm not right. sure that that's going to be there. I mean, you know, the people we talked about in 2008, well, 2008 is a long time ago if you're 20 <laughs> years old. Uh, and maybe you're now looking for, as this thing moves so quickly, maybe you're looking for somebody else. Um, and the appeal may be not in a kind of like a governmental institutional way. Uh, no, no one seems comfortable with government. No one seems to trust it until there's a problem when they expect the government to do something about it. Well, it's interesting because you'll see people uh, on the on the left, yeah. the the real left, not the moderate left. People on the left and on the right dissatisfied with government. Yeah. But you mentioned Rand Paul and young people. It's really interesting. He's had some public appearances yeah. where he's had really positive response. Uh, from from younger audiences. Yeah. I, he, he reminds me, uh, in a sense, of Howard Dean in the Democratic side. In other words, the establishment party folks may not be in love with that, uh, but I think he's a force to be reckoned with. I, you know, he has the experience of his father having, you know, run and, you know, sort of went through all the Iowa and the New Hampshire's and the things like that. And it, look, it's, right now it's, it's funny because, you know, the Democrats used to have this chaotic ideological <laughs> spectrum of dozens right. of candidates and the Republicans sort of had their front runner tagged from the beginning. Right. And now it's almost flipped around. Now you have this, you know, grab bag of candidates on the Republican side for 2016 and there's a sense of Hillary Clinton as, dare I say, inevitable I yet agree. again on the Democratic side. Um, so we'll have to see how that all works out. But Rand Paul, a force to be reckoned with, uh, along with you know, a crowd of folks, each of whom sort of sees their own way to the White House as being plausible. You mentioned the idea of um, uh, President Obama or Barack Obama coming on the scene in 2008, and now President Obama is going through a, a, a tough period yeah. in terms of uh, popularity. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's been a difficult economy, especially for ordinary uh, uh, working families and that sort of thing. Do you think that's the only reason for this sort of uh, precipitous drop in um, popularity? What do you think oh, is going on? Well, a lot of things. First of all, you know, the so-called six-year itch. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's not unusual for, uh, for, in fact, it's typically the case that you, you, know, you lose seats in your final midterm right, election. Right, that sixth year of, of, yeah, of, uh, of a two-term president, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's brutal. I think this time, uh, part of it, as we alluded to in the beginning, was the, the notion that, you know, the Republicans clearly were running against Obama, but the Democrats, you know, you know, you own the candidate of your own party. Right. You really can't distance yourself. <laughs> You've got to find a way. That's to, your guy, for better or worse. That's right. You've got to find a way to articulate. So what was the Democrats' message this election? Well, it was, I'm sort of not part of Barack Obama. I mean, there, there was no theme. There was nothing out there. I don't think the president was pushing an agenda during the campaign. Uh, and certainly the candidates, you know, maybe a little bit on the minimum wage, perhaps. But, you know, there, there wasn't much going on on the way of the Democratic side. The Republicans had their message. We're not Barack Obama. And if you're unhappy, send a message. Uh, so, so in a sense, it was really a problem from the Democrats. So I think that that's a lot of what was going on. And then, you know, there have been improvements in the macroeconomic numbers. So the unemployment is, you know, 
reasonably right, it's better. Under, under 6%. Uh, you know, gross national yeah. product is better. Uh, you know, different uh, growth indices have improved, but people are still not feeling it. They're still having difficulty making ends meet, and they still have those, those worries uh, about, um, you know, long-term financial security and retirement or whatever the, the, you know, is where they are in their own life cycles and, and what's important to them. Um, so I think that they're still searching for answers, and the current Obama team doesn't seem to have those answers, whether it's because they don't have the answers or whether they haven't been able to figure out a way to get it through <laughs> Congress or a combination of both. Right. Um, right now, I think we're going to have both sides, you know, sort of bluff that they're going to have a more conciliatory time, uh, I suspect, during the next six months. And maybe there'll be a few things that get through. We'll have to see. I, one of the things that I think has um, really been odd, for, for the Democrats, African-American votes are so uh, important. For Obama, he's been sure. getting more than 90 percent of the black mm -hmm. vote. Um, and yet, neither um, President Obama specifically, nor Democrats in general, seem to want to go out there in any kind of aggressive way yeah. and campaign for black votes. And we've seen a lot of close races in this past yeah. election where higher black turnout may have made sure. a, a difference. A, a yeah. difference. Um, is there a, a, a clear explanation for this? I mean, I know they're concerned about white voters or they're concerned about voters who, uh, you know, whatever they're thinking, but what, what's your take well, I on think, this? I think that has to do with some, somewhat at one level with Barack Obama. I mean, I think his style has, you know, not been to, to rally the base as much. Let, let, but why? Well, I, I Who's ever heard of that? <laughs> well, it's not a, it doesn't appear to have been a winning... It has, uh, not, it has but, not worked for him or for Democrats. But, but you know... Uh, well, it has worked for Obama. He got yeah. elected twice. Yes, but it, it doesn't work. It hasn't uh, helped his yeah. agenda. But, but clearly, and, you know, I don't admit to being wrong too often. <laughs> I'm, I, with my baseball teams and my football teams, I'm wrong an awful lot, apparently, lately. I'm You're talking to a, a Jets fan. Oh, well, hey, I'm sorry. I'm a Giant fan. We, we share similar, <laughs> similar problems. But, you know, I think Barack Obama, to some degree, needs to, you know, ha have provided a better rationale for even some of his accomplishments. You know, politics is hard at one level and it's not hard. Say you're going to do it, do it, say you've done it. I think after that, things get a little cute. And I think, you know, to say to the Democrats, you know, there's the African-American community, there's also the Latino vote. Right. Um, you know, that is a group that is really up for grabs politically. I. Say, I say I'm not wrong a lot. Well, I was wrong. I thought after the 2012 election, it was in both sides' interest to move on immigration right. reform. I, it seemed that the Republicans had to do something, and the Democrats wanted to do something, right. and I thought it was going to happen. Here we are right now, two years later, and we're discussing, will there be some kind of executive order, or will the Republicans come up with right. a bill that Obama can sign? I mean, I find that shocking that the Democrats took that vote for granted, I, and, and I couldn't agree more. We looked at our polls. They should have been aggressive and, and pushed the Republicans on that. And then if the Republicans yeah. blocked it, at then least you, have, you get the political you, benefit. You, you, you force the other guy's hand. Exactly. And, and, and Obama's style hasn't been that. It's been much more of a conciliatory style. I mean, he, even with health care, health care has benefited some people. There's no doubt about it. But it was confused as to what it was. And he gave up on the public option before right. he even... Right. So, Look, I don't play in those leagues. <laughs> I'm sure there's people, they pay a lot of money to figure out these strategies. But, you know, you want to offer something and then pull back as you need to. Push a public option, pull it back when, when, it, when, when you need to make your concessions. Don't start with your concessions because it only gets worse from there. <laughs> well, um, we're running out of time, but I'd like to have you come back Absolutely. soon and we'll talk to. about presidential politics ah. uh, next time around. Lee, thank you so much for this. Uh, we'll Delighted. be back in a moment with a final word. The latest UN report on global warming is more frightening than any Hollywood horror epic, and yet it is not getting nearly enough attention. According to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have already entered an irreversible course of extreme climate disruption that will bring us close to a threshold beyond which it will be very difficult for humans and our natural ecosystem to cope. The panel spelled out the potential dire consequences if we don't take much more radical steps to slow down the Earth's warming and its inevitable corollaries, rising sea levels, ever more extreme weather events, the destruction of glaciers, 
and the disappearance of ice in the seas. Those consequences, if this disruption is allowed to continue unabated, include the mass extinction of plants and animals, catastrophic increases in global poverty and hunger, frequent and devastating floods in major cities of the world, and the loss of entire island nations. At times, the heat will become so dangerous in some places that are currently inhabited that it will be risky to go outside. Already in the year 2014, we have seen the hottest May, June, August, and September ever recorded. Globally, we may be living through the hottest year ever. Are we going to wake up and take effective steps to ward off this looming disaster? Or are we going to continue sleeping while the world burns? That's all for now. See you next time.